Okay, welcome everyone to ASCP's Best Practices in Advanced NSCLC Project ECHO video conference series. Today's session focuses on overcoming challenges to molecular testing in advanced NSCLC. My name is Kelly Beimer. I'm ASCP's Director of Learning Innovations, and I'll be the facilitator for today's session. A copy of the disclosures can be seen on the screen. In addition, today's session is funded by independent educational grants from Janssen Biotech, Inc., administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs, LLC, and by Pfizer, Inc. Please note that this video conference is being recorded. And by participating in this recorded video conference, you're agreeing that ASCP may use the recording of your image and statements on ASCP's website and YouTube channel. So before we get started, we want to get to know you and tell you a little bit about how these Project ECHO video conferences work. Uh, we have a good sized crowd today, so we're hoping that you all will take a moment to enter uh, in your name, your title, and your institution into the chat so that we can all get to know each other. So I'll give everybody just a few moments here to type in their introductions. And for those of you who are just, uh, just joining us and just logging in, uh, we're doing a quick round of introductions in the chat. So type in your name, your title, and where you're from. And then as these introductions are coming through, I also do want to tell you a little bit about uh, the Project Echo format that we're using today. We're incredibly excited to have Dr. Faye Dong here with us today to share his expertise on molecular testing and advanced NSDLC. And then following his presentation, Dr. Raghavendra Palapa has volunteered to share his expertise along with the challenging case that he's faced in his institutions. And these Project ECHO sessions are designed to be interactive. So throughout the presentation, we'll be opening the floor up for discussion at several points. And our hope is that um, each of you will have the opportunity to ask questions, provide comments, share your experiences, and learn from each other. Um, as you know, as you all know, there's no easy answers, no one right way to do things with molecular testing. So we're really hoping to come together and learn from each other. So please feel, we hope you all feel comfortable sharing, you know, the ways that you're, that you're doing this in your institutions. Um, so please uh, raise your hands during these sessions, type in your comments and questions into the chat or Q&A functionality as well throughout. And then we'll just do a few final reminders before we get started. Even though these sessions are designed to be interactive and collaborative, your microphones will be muted until you raise your hands and are called upon to speak during the, the Q&A uh, portion of the discussion. And then during the discussions, we just wanna remind everybody uh, to not share any protected health information or any personally identifiable information about your patients. And then finally, CME and CMLE credit is available for this event. So instructions for claiming credit will be shared at the end of this presentation. It'll also be available on our website and we will also send you an email reminder to the email address that you provided at the time of res registration. So now it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Fei Dong to today's Project ECHO video conference. Dr. Dong is an associate pathologist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, as well as an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. He'll be sharing best practices in advanced NSCLC molecular testing. Throughout the presentation, I'd like to encourage all of you once again to ask questions, share your comments along the way. So I'll now turn it over to Dr. Dong to share his slides and begin. All right, hello everyone, uh, and thank you all for coming. I'm just gonna share my screen here real quick. And hopefully you can see that. Um, Thank you again for inviting me, Kelly, to uh, present at today's webinar, uh, and thank you to the ASCP. Uh, my name is Faye. I'm a molecular pathologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and uh, the topic of this webinar is overcoming challenges to molecular testing in advanced lung cancer. I have no disclosures. Uh, there are certainly many challenges that face molecular laboratories today uh, for this introductory lecture. I want to review the history and the current state of molecular testing for lung cancer, 
and try to frame the discussion around the challenges that have been brought about by clinical demand in precision medicine and how molecular testing has met these challenges to date and what we're gonna do uh, going forward. The challenges include the development of targeted therapies of, uh, for EGFR mutations, which have led to a need for single gene testing, um, as well as the expanding indications for targeted uh, therapies beyond EGFR, which have led to multiplex gene testing, including NGS. Uh, the selection of single gene versus panel testing uh, remains an important topic today. Another challenge is the push to exp expedite testing and to develop non-invasive diagnostics, uh, which has brought about an interest in the analysis of cell-free tumor DNA. And finally, there have been an evolution in the targeted therapies used to treat uh, lung cancer and various mechanisms of resistance have developed. And that presents a challenge for us um, because our, the labs need to develop new strategies for testing or to modify ex existing testing strategies. So first, let's take a historical perspective and talk about targeted therapies uh, for EGFR. In the initial trials of EGFR inhibitors for lung cancer, um, the targeted therapy called Jafitinib uh, showed no benefit compared to chemotherapy for advanced lung cancer in an unselected population. Here you can see the Kaplan-Meier curves for the targeted therapy uh, shown in yellow, uh, and it overlaps with the curve for chemotherapy shown in blue. However, if you subgroup trial patients into those who have a cancer with EGFR mutation uh, and uh, those who have cancers that do not, there is a clear benefit from targeted therapy for cancers with EGFR mutation um, and uh, no benefit from EGFR therapy, uh, targeted therapy for uh, cancers that are EGFR wild type. Um, and this observation really uh, brought about the need for molecular testing in solid tumors in the uh, laboratory and ushered in an era of um, targeted therapies in solid tumors. This plot from COSMIC demonstrates the uh, distribution of somatic mutations in the EGFR gene and here you can see that the vast majority of primary EGFR gene mutations, about 90% of them, occur at one of two hotspots within the gene. Um, they occur either as a substitution mutation in the EGFR exon 21 um, uh, region called L858R, or as an in-frame deletion in EGFR exon 19. Here are the sequences of these two regions, uh, and the mutations are also uh, shown. The top figure shows a single nucleotide substitution leading to an amino acid change um, that leads to a, 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 a codon change in L858R. The bottom figure shows an in-frame deletion in EGFR exon 19. Um, canonically, it's 15 base pairs, uh, but it can be 18 base pairs, 12 base, 12 base pairs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, both changes lead to constitutive activation of the EGFR tyrosine kinase, which promotes tumor development, but also make these tumor cells vulnerable to targeted therapy. We can test for these alterations in the molecular laboratory. Um, so for the single G, uh, base pair substitution, uh, L858R, we can design a PCR reaction. Uh, this is an example of a classic TACMAN reaction where we design PCR primers around the uh, region of mutation. And an additional probe is introduced that only binds to a mutant sequence and not a wild type sequence. If the mutant sequence is present, the uh, TAC polymerase will cleave the probe as it undergoes uh, extension, releasing a signal that allows for the detection of L858R. And you can see the differences in the PCR curves in a EGFR mutated and a wild type sample. Similarly, we can design a PCR reaction for the EGFR exon 19 deletion. Um, so the PCR product size is, is expected to be smaller in molecules with a deletion, and that can be detected by a capillary gel electrophoresis. Uh, so here are a couple of uh, examples of electropherograms on the top demonstrating a sample with only wild type sequence and the bottom demonstrating a, a, a sample with the EGFR exon 19 deletion mutation.
For many years, molecular laboratories relied on single gene testing because EGFR was a sole indication for molecular analysis in lung cancers. Um, however, as um, indications expanded uh, for targeted therapies and new technologies have emerged, specifically next generation sequencing, um, these changes have also changed the landscape of clinical molecular testing. Outgene fusion was the um, second FDA approved clinical indication for targeted therapy in lung cancer. Um, here is the original trial for a crizotinib, which is a um, ALK a tyrosine kinase inhibitor um, that shows that uh, crizotinib, uh, patients who are treated with crizotinib without fusion had improved progression-free survival compared to conventional chemotherapy. Um, it is notable that in that trial, they did not demonstrate a benefit to overall survival. Uh, however, patients who are on crizotinib also reported better function and improved quality of life compared to patients who are on chemotherapy. And much of this has to do with the um, toxic side effect profiles of chemotherapy uh, versus uh, targeted therapies. ALK testing was traditionally performed by fluorescent in situ hybridization or FISH. And this image shows an ALK break apart probe with a green signal um, signifying the five prime end of ALK and a red signal um, signifying the three prime end of ALK. And FISH can be reinterpreted as positive if there is a break apart or split signal as shown in the image on the left or if there is a five prime deletion of the ALK gene, leaving a red only signal um, as shown in the image on the right. Immunohistochemistry is another way to screen for ALK gene fusion um, since this fusion leads to protein expression. And therefore labs rapidly incorporated ALK into the uh, workflow and the testing algorithm um, where the pathology specimen being tested uh, would be sent separately for analysis for EGFR as well as ALK. So ALK is often screened by immunohistochemistry, which is a cost-effective and a readily available method. And if that is positive, um, it would be confirmed by FISH in the molecular laboratory. Uh, however, the strategy of parallel single gene testing becomes much more difficult as the number of targets increase. Um, so here uh, is a pie chart demonstrating the distribution of types of uh, oncogenic driver mutations seen in non-small cell lung cancer, uh, both in the TCGA on the left, as well as kind of in our initial experience in our laboratory on the right, and it is quite predictable. Um, the molecular genetics of lung cancer is defined by these um, oncogenes uh, that have driver mutations. Uh, these driver mutations tend to be mutually exclusive and activate the MAP kinase pathway. And you can see that uh, for a while we couldn't do much about many of these mutations, but since 2016, there have been multiple FDA approvals for targeted therapies linked to mutations um, in these driver oncogenes. Uh, a major question now is, you know, what is the optimal testing strategy for these patients uh, to, detect, to, to be able to detect mutations in multiple genes? Uh, increasingly, laboratories are adopting a panel testing approach by employing next-generation sequencing assays. Uh, next-generation sequencing is also called massively parallel sequencing. And depending on the platform, uh, millions to billions of individual DNA molecules can be sequenced um, at the same time. And multiple patient specimens are also pulled into a single sequencing run to reduce the overall sequencing cost. Uh, these panels are mostly designed to be able to detect sequence alterations, but some panels can also detect copy number changes and structural variants, and that may include gene fusions. Um, the type of uh, cancer NGS panels uh, vary uh, quite a bit, but in clinical practice, the gene panels typically range from as few as 50 genes, um, and the larger custom panels may have as many as 1,000 genes or more. And next generation sequencing tests have been demonstrated to have good performance characteristics. Um, data from CAP proficiency testing uh, uh, samples show that for labs that use NGS for cancer testing, there is a high degree of interlaboratory agreement uh, shown on the left. And also compared to single gene assays, 
uh, NGS assays have been demonstrated to have at least equivalent performance um, in cancer proficiency uh, samples. Um, and this leads to a major question in diagnostic, test, uh, diagnostic testing today uh, for lung cancer, which is, you know, should we be performing sequential um, testing with single gene assays, or should we consolidate all testing onto a, a single next generation sequencing platform? Uh, one argument for NGS testing is that um, NGS can potentially yield more information with a limited amount of DNA. Um, this figure is from a, um, a paper from a commercial laboratory that is running single gene tests uh, showing uh, that biomarker testing success rates do decrease as the number of requested um, targets increase in their experience. Uh, there are potentially multiple um, benefits of NGS um, that includes um, the testing for multiple genes with a single aliquot of DNA uh, that uh, in, our, in my laboratory, um, we require 50 nanograms of DNA um, in order to proceed with next generation sequencing. Um, we can consolidate multiple clinical indications, including lung cancer, colon cancer, and an increasing um, number of indications into a single platform. And additional genomic information, such as sequence, uh, such as copy number variants and mutational signatures may be um, gathered from um, NGS testing uh, compared to traditional single gene testing. Uh, but there are also drawbacks when you consider um, uh, sequencing with NGS panels. Uh, for example, uh, batch sequencing um, is usually done with pooled, pooled cases. Um, and in our laboratory, we do 40 samples per run, uh, which means that the volume should be you know, high enough to be able to batch cases into a single run for it to be a cost effective um, tests. Uh, the turnaround time is also longer for traditional hybrid capture NGS panels, um, and we put in our lab a uh, turnaround time of about 14 days from the time when we receive the specimen. When you do NGS, you do have an increasing need for technical expertise as well as personnel. Um, that means um, technologists and laboratory scientists who are trained in the assay and are, uh, can help with the interpretation. Uh, informatics is also a challenge. There is a vast amount of data that is generated by next generation sequencing. So you have to have a clean informatics pipeline that is able to uh, do a lot of filtering for you. And you also have to consider the cost of data storage. When you interpret next generation sequen se sequencing tests, um, the amount of information you get is more complex. Um, so therefore you need to have pathologists who are familiar with the assays and be able to uh, perform interpretation uh, we do get a pretty high number of variants of uncertain significance uh, in our particular assay. And finally, there is a, uh, this issue of uncertain regulatory environment, um, uh, and especially for reimbursement uh, for NGS testing in molecular laboratories. So I know this is kind of a, a major area of consideration in molecular testing. I'm going to move away from this subject for now, but I'm happy to address any additional questions about um, panel testing at the end of the session. All right, so next let's talk about the continuing need for rapid non-invasive diagnostics, uh, which has led to an interest in the so-called liquid biopsy and the analysis of um, cell-free DNA. Uh, this, types of, this type of testing has been based on the observation that tumor cells can shed nucleic acids into the bloodstream. Uh, some of these nucleic acids are bound by histones or are present in exosomes which stabilize them um, enough such that these nucleic acids can be detected uh, in, a patient, uh, in a patient's plasma sample. Um, it is important to note that circulating tumor DNA is only a small amount of all nucleic acids in the blood. Uh, within the blood, uh, uh, there's the whole blood, which is everything, and then the acellular component is plasma. Um, Cell-free DNA can be extracted from plasma, but these nucleic acids uh, may also be derived from um, uh, non-neoplastic uh, cells uh, in addition to tumor cells. Uh, the quantity of cell-free DNA and circulating tumor DNA is variable. Uh, patients with advanced, sta advanced stage cancer are more likely to have a higher tumor uh, burden and more circulating tumor DNA. Um, and this has brought about um, uh, a challenge for a need for more um, ultra-sensitive methods of detection, 
uh, beyond the usual NGS protocol. And if NGS is used, then the pro protocol would have to be modified to increase the depth of coverage to be able to detect mutations in low uh, varinellial fractions. Um, another option that is not um, based on estimation sequencing is to use other technologies that offer ultra-sensitive detection. Um, so our laboratory uses um, a methodology called droplet digital PCR uh, for the rapid detec detection of EGFR mutations. Um, again, here we use a TACMAN-based method with a mutation-specific probe. Uh, the sample DNA templates are compartmentalized into aqueous droplets by microfluidics. Um, and then the PCR is performed to completion and the result in each droplet is read by flow cytometry. Um, here, the result on the uh, bottom right shows an example of an LG EGFR L858R mutation that is present at less than 1% iron allele fraction. Uh, in addition to potentially not having to process a surgical uh, specimen for these uh, liquid biopsies, a single gene analysis like droplet digital PCR can allow for a potentially faster turnaround time. And in our lab's experience, median turnaround time for our EGFR single gene assay um, is six days compared to about 13 days for panel NGS. Um, and finally, I want to discuss the evolution and targeted therapies in lung cancer and therapeutic resistance in particular, um, and which can affect testing strategies within the molecular laboratory. I think this is a case that nicely illustrates uh, multiple mechanisms of resistance to targeted EGFR therapy in a patient. And I think it's amazing because you can look at the screen and you can know exactly what that patient went through and what kind of therapies they've been on. Um, so this was a patient uh, with lung cancer that had a primary EGFR mutation that's not demonstrated on this slide. But you can see that the patient has a clone that has a T790M resistance mutation in response to their primary targeted therapy. The patient then received a second line EGFR inhibitor, OCmertinib, which is active against the EGFR T790M resistance mutation. And the patient then developed a, another recurrence with additional subclones in um, 792 and uh, 797 that are now resistant to OCmertinib. Here's a diagram um, showing the patient's clinical course. Um, again, they had a primary EGFR mutation leading to targeted therapy with the first generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor, developing the classic T790M resistance mutation, then leading to therapy with a second line inhibitor called OCmertinib, which then developed subsequent resistance subclones in a subsequent um, recurrence. And again, this is the patient's molecular profile demonstrating the relationship of all of these different mutations that are present in the specimen. And that patient can be contract contrasted with this other patient who had the same history, except in this patient, you can see that the secondary resistance mutation C797S is seen involving different DNA molecules um, than the primary resistance mutation in T790M. And um, seeing these mutations in, in different molecules suggests that the clone that is involved in this patient's progression may actually be resensitized to the first generation of tyrosine kinase inhibitors because T790M is absent in that particular clone. So this actually brings about an additional challenge in reporting and molecular diagnostic results, where it is now helpful for molecular pathologists to be able to provide additional context and clinical interpretation beyond just reporting the variants and in, in this case, it is helpful to report whether the two mutations involve the same molecule or involve different molecules. The traditional testing algorithm has uh, now also been disrupted um, by the finding that patients who are treated with osimertinib um, instead of a standard EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy um, have improved outcomes. Uh, here is the Kaplan-Meier curve um, comparing therapy with osimertinib um, compared to a standard TKI. And since um, T790M is the most common mechanism of resistance to traditional tyrosine kinase inhibitors, many of our laboratories have optimized testing strategies around the detection of T790M. And as clinical practice changes, um, that's all going to change um, because as osimertinib replaces these, these other traditional tyrosine kinase inhibitors for first-line therapy, the expected pattern of resistance mutations are going to be different, so we have to adapt our testing strategies um, accordingly. <laughs>
All right, so I think I'm coming up to 20 minutes. Um, so in summary, um, today we reviewed multiple historical and current challenges in lung cancer testing. Um, these challenges were brought about by increasing clinical demand and have led to solutions by single gene testing, uh, multi-gene NGS testing, and the evaluation of cell-free DNA. Um, and test, uh, testing strategies will continue to evolve you know, with the evolution in um, therapeutic options. And I will um, end uh, the talk by reviewing the drivers, uh, by these drivers, by reviewing these drivers of innovation, uh, which include uh, the presence of new targeted therapies, um, technological advances like NGS, as well as biological insights. Um, these factors drive clinical demand and the need for advanced molecular testing. And it's important to note that um, as pathologists, molecular testing does not exist in a vacuum. Um, and there are many factors that affect our clinical practice, and uh, we have to be prepared to adapt. Um, and with that, I will end it here and uh, turn it over back to Kelly and uh, Ragat, and I'm happy to take questions at the end of the session. Thank you again for your time. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your very informative presentation. That was fantastic. So we are now at the Q&A portion of our presentation, and we would like to encourage everybody to, uh, to go ahead and share, um, share your feedback, share your experiences, um, ask any questions that you may have. So what you can do is use the raise hand functionality in Zoom, and then we will unmute you when we call on you. You may get a prompt um, on your screen asking you if you'd like to unmute your microphone. And, um, the, the raise hand function is typically in the bottom of your screen near the uh, chat or the Q&A function. So I believe we did have uh, somebody raise their hand. Uh, Michelle, are you able to unmute them? Yes, uh, they also asked a question that I forwarded over to the panelists. Sure, I see the question in the chat. Would you like to um, go ahead and ask your question? Um, for everyone to hear. Dr. Patel. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Uh, you know, I think you answered my question about the comparison of turnaround times between tissue and liquid, but I did have a second question about, you know, what is the, you know, survival benefit of patients who are uh, provided osimertinib first line versus patients who are given first-generation TKI initially, and then uh, are given osimertinib as a second-line treatment. So when you look at the entire process, uh, what, you know, is osimertinib really the best option? Uh, because after osimertinib, there's really, uh, as far as I know, no, uh, no targeted therapy option in the setting of resistance, but I could be wrong about that. Uh, but yeah, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you. I think that's a, that's a great question. So um, if you have osimertinib, there are mechanisms of resistance that can develop um, based on uh, uh, exposure to osimertinib. Um, and depending on the resistance mutations, actually once resistance develops, these patients can be potentially treated in the traditional first-line tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So there's a question like, what is the overall outcome and what is the best strategy should you you know, treat them with, you know, traditional standard first-line inhibitors, wait for them to develop um, secondary mutations, and you treat them with, you know, osimertinib, and then that develops, and then and so on and so forth, or do you treat with osimertinib up front, and then um, eventually um, deal with, you know, resistance mutations that, that come up afterward? Um, so I think the answer to that is not certain yet, just because that is so um, early in terms of adoption of osimertinib as first-line therapy, but it will be very interesting to see how that evolves, um, you know, as, as the data comes in and actually what is the best strategy long-term. I'm not thinking, you know, one or two years in advance, um, but thinking like, you know, five or, five or six years, right? Um, when we're turning um, a lung cancer which choose to be deadly into more of a chronic condition. I think that's a, a particularly good question that really hits the point. Um, I, I, I will address your, your question about turn, difference in turnaround time. Uh, you asked the question, what is the difference in turnaround time between a tissue and, and liquid? And I think it really depends on the type of assays that you try to employ. Uh, 
um, deployed. So if you um, are looking at liquid biopsies, but you want to do panel next generation sequencing, then the turnaround time will, will, will be similar to the turnaround time in, in tissue. Um, um, so it depends on which um, strategy, testing strategy you choose. But in addition, in terms of, so that's what we think about in the lab, like what is turnaround time between when we get the tissue and when we're able to report the result. But if you're thinking about overall turnaround time, there's also turnaround time that's lagged that is, you know, getting the anatomic pathology specimen, uh, making that diagnosis, tracking down the tissue, sending it for molecular testing. So if you're able to do a liquid biopsy and send that directly to the lab, that can potentially save you time um, as well um, between, you know, when, um, you know, uh, when the sample is drawn and when the final micro report is given. Great, and we've had another question come into the chat asking how often should NGS be repeated considering the tumor progression and new mutations? Yeah, I think that's also a great question. Um, so NGS can be repeated depending on clinical indication. Um, so usually uh, molecular testing, um, as we kind of um, suggested, happens in, in a kind of a couple of different scenarios. So one is the primary diagnosis of advanced non-small cell lung cancer in which you're trying to detect what is the primary mutation um, and then uh, to try to treat the patient based on that. And then um, I think you wouldn't probably follow them uh, for a, a, by, by molecular testing um, if they're then treated and, and not symptomatic. But I think usually patients, when there is evidence of progression, um, then testing can be performed again to look for a mechanism of resistance. Um, and that timing uh, between initial treatment and uh, progression is usually a period of months to, to years. Excellent. And we're going to take one more question before turning things over to Dr. Palapa. And the last question for now is, uh, do you go for ALK rearrangement using FISH or NGS? And they're wondering what the pros and cons of each method might be. Yeah, I, I think that's a really great question. Um, so I think the uh, essence of molecular pathology is choosing the right assay and choosing the right test. Um, so a couple of things. So one is if you do NGS, what is the NGS test? There are some NGS tests that are based on RNA that are really um, um, optimized for detection of rearrangements, and that includes ALK. Um, so some of those are really good at detecting ALK rearrangements. Uh, when you're looking at panel NGS um, on DNA, often many of these uh, rearrangement breakpoints are actually happening in introns, uh, which may not be covered by your panel. So that depends on your design. Um, many NGS panels will not even cover ALK. So you have to know that going in. And if ALK is covered by an, an uh, DNA panel, the overall sensitivity may not be as high. There are additional benefits to FISH, including that, you know, FISH is really um, gives you spatial information. Um, you're able to localize tumor cells. And if you have just a cluster of tumor cells that you can um, really, uh, or you're confident that are really tumor, you can potentially detect that ALK rearrangement. And that can be potentially be, be even done on a specimen that uh, would not yield enough uh, DNA for molecular testing at all or for NGS. So it really depends on the type of specimens uh, that you have, uh, what kind of NGS might be available to you. It's a great question. Excellent, thanks. We've had uh, some, some additional questions come in, but we're going to go ahead um, and uh, take a break for a moment. We're going to pause and begin our next presentation. So in, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Raghavender Palapo. Dr. Palapa is an assistant professor at Pathology at Virginia Commonwealth University, and he'll be sharing his expertise along with an interesting case that highlights some of the best practices and lessons that he's learned on optimizing testing for patients with NSCLC. And then after his presentation is done, we'll open up again for discussion. So please continue to type your questions in or raise your hand. So I'll now turn it over to Dr. Palapa to begin. Thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, it's a pleasure and opportunity uh, to speak here um, and let me share my presentation. Can you all see my presentation and hear me well? Yes. Great. So uh, I'm going to give an anatomic pathologist perspective. So I'm a practicing pulmonary pathologist here at Virginia Commonwealth University. 
so I'm going to tell you my perspective as anatomic pathologist in dealing or overcoming challenges to molecular testing in advanced non-small cell lung cancer. I have the following disclosures. So the objectives remains the same. Uh, I will try to enumerate the solutions if, if applicable with some case examples. So the NCCN guidelines for metastatic non-small non -small cell lung cancer as the following recommendations um, needs to be tested in a CLIA certified lab. Uh, so for EGFR mutations, BRAF, ALK fusions, ROS1 fusions, metexon 14 skipping mutations, red tree arrangements, and even though PDL1 is not a molecular test, it has to be done with immunohistochemistry. And along with the KRAS mutation, uh, recently the KRAS G12C mutation has renewed, has got a lot of attention because of a recent FDA approved drug, Sotaracib. And again, the percentage of this G12C mutation is reported as 13% out of the total 30% KRAS mutations you can expect to see in non-small cell lung cancers or lung adenocarcinomas. So uh, this global survey by International Association Society of Lung Cancer is very relevant um, when, we, when the molecular testing is concerned in lung cancer. Even though it was an international survey and there was five different regions, Asia, Europe, North America, Latin America. Um, so they were divided into five different regions from the world. And there was a total of about more than 2000 respondents uh, from more than 100 countries. And the most important lesson we learned from this survey was less than 50% of patients in their respective countries received molecular testing for lung cancer diagnosis. And even though I must tell you the most of the surveys, the 50% of the survey in this article or in this uh, study was from Asia, 11% from North America, that is United States and Canada, it's still very relevant to us. And the five most common barriers seen was the increased cost and the quality and standards of the specimen and also the assays, different assays, the different molecular testing platforms and tests used and accessibility to this test in different parts of the world. And simple awareness about need of this test when the patient gets a diagnosis of lung adenocarcinoma. So many people did not know the updated recommendations by CAP, AMP, IASLC, so those recommendations, like I mentioned before, as per the NCCN guidelines. And then increased turnaround time, because if you send this test individually, obviously you're adding on the time compared to multiplex testing all simultaneously, then you should be able to reduce the turnaround time. So the five common barriers had answered many, many questions for us based on this study. So I would like to put the challenges grouped into three classes, technical, in that we have to deal with smaller samples with less cellularity and also discordance between multiple test methodologies and technology specific failures and quality assurance. Then in terms of operational or institutional or laboratory specific, um, in that we have turnaround time questions. Some places it's two weeks, some places it's more than two weeks, some places it's 15 days. And also it depends on whether there's a centralized testing or a distributed type of testing. If they send out various tests or if they do everything in house. And again, the knowing about this recommendations, the education part. And the reporting format useful for the oncologist. And again, of course, digital storage for the NGS data. And there are some cancer or the tumor specific biology challenges, something like heterogeneity, which commonly has been described in breast cancers for HER2 expression. Similarly, PDL1 expression has got the same kind of heterogeneity in the tumor 
in the lung cancers uh, arena as well. And then as Do Dr. Dong was discussing about the T790M, so evolution and resistance, development of this resistance in these various types of mutations like EGFR, which is the most important one. And then evolving new markers. So every single day, in addition to PDL one you might be hearing about newer things like tumor mutational burden. And also, what do we do with complex genetic abnormalities? So I would like to put this into these three boxes as challenges. So this great study by multiple groups, you can see these multiple societies combined together. They came up with this, they reviewed so many studies, like more than 4,000 studies. And out of that, they filtered and looked for the studies with evidence and they developed 16 guideline statements. I would not give you all the 16 guideline statements here. I would refer to this article, but there were three strong recommendations that is EBUS transbronchial needle aspirations can be used as in for initial evaluation from the mediastinal lymph nodes for diagnosis, for staging, for to assess recurrence and also for metastasis. And also if there is hilar masses, still EBUS TBNAs can be used. And then rapid on-site cytologic evaluation to find if there is adequate tumor material following these procedures. That was a strong recommendation as well. And the third most important recommendation, that's where we have many of our challenges, or at least some of them, the cytology specimens, because most of your advanced non-small cell lung cancer settings or metastasis settings, you have these small specimens and cytology would be the only way to get to them and get the material. So the smears, the cell, cell blocks, liquid-based cytology, all were recommended as enough for or adequate for ancillary studies. So now the question about the smaller samples. And again, first of all, obtaining samples sometimes can be a limiting factor. But when you, when you have the sample, what is the minimum, optimum uh, percentage of tumor nuclei? It means optimum is 30% or like Dr. Dong was mentioning, 50 nanogram of DNA material. And if you want additional RNA-based methodology or techniques to be done, then maybe a little more than that. But at least minimum of 20% tumor nuclei should be needed for NGS. And again, minimal amounts of mucin or necrosis would always be ideal. And if you are in a place where you have very minimal material and you have to do on a priority basis, then EGFR, KRAS, ALG. But if, you ha if I want to choose two most important, EGFR and ALG would be the ones. And of course, PDL1, Obviously, when you have both smears and cell block, you can use the smears for next gen sequencing because they're always better at maintaining the, the, the DNA or the nucleic acid material compared to the cell blocks formalin, formalin treated. So smears are any day preferred compared to the cell blocks, which you can keep it for performing immunohistochemistry to get to an accurate histological diagnosis. And again, in those cytology smears, it's important to make sure that there is representative tumor material is present and also at least 50% of them is viable and there is no necrosis. And like I mentioned, the cell block material, depending on how much material is present, it's important that you have to be very frugal in applying the number of immunohistochemical stains. For if I, have, if I have the classic morphology, I would sign it on, on the h &E and save the material for genomic testing. But if I need to do a stain, I would try to keep it as minimal as two stains. If in case of a poorly differentiated non-small cell where the differential diagnosis includes squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma, I would just do TTF1 and P40 and keep the remaining for PDL1 and the smears for NGS testing.
and it's always important to communicate the scant cellularity to the clinician so that they can start thinking about an alternate specimen or if the patient is already has multiple comorbidities then they might also have a discussion of getting a liquid biopsy to look for egfr mutations so that communication is always relevant in this scenarios so as egfr was extensively discussed let me jump on to this alk uh, the some of the technical things what we see uh, in our practice so alk mutated lung adenocarcinomas they have a specific morphology and hnd stain like what you see here they usually have a cribriform kind of pattern or acinar growth pattern with mucinous type of tumor cells on the right upper upper right hnd figure and generally they can also have signet ring type of cells and in 2011 fda approved fish for detecting the alk rearrangements for lung adenocarcinomas and followed by in 2015 they approved this alk immunohistochemistry by d5f3 clone so there are several different clones of alk so this clone has got the best performance and the sensitivity and specificity so they approved this d5f3 ihc clone as a stand alone test to detect this alk rearrangement and as you know in lung adenocarcinomas the most common alk fusion is with eml4 and when you do this alk immunohistochemistry you'll find a granular cytoplasmic kind of staining which is very characteristic unlike in anaplastic large cell lymphoma where the most common fusion is npm1 alk fusion there you'll find more nuclear and cytoplasmic stain so the concordance based on only the d5f3 clone is 99.4% with fish again we don't have that robust kind of data to compare this both especially with the d5f3 clone these are just classic examples showing you the alk d5f3 stain in this is from my lab so as you know the alk staining there's nothing like we have to quantify similar to what we have to do in breast cancer like er percentage pr percentage there's nothing like that in alk any positivity is positive so it's a binary kind of scoring positive negative and eml4 alk fusion shows granular cytoplasmic staining like you can see in this figure on the left side while the alk in the alcl and a plastic large cell lymphoma will have a more nuclear and cytoplasmic type of staining so here's a case we had so this elderly man had a metastatic lung adenocarcinoma to the bone in his humerus and i don't have the hni stain here i'm just showing you the alk immunohistochemistry with two different clones one is d5f3 and alk1 so you can see the d5f3 shows some kind of granular staining but it's not very robust or very positive in this but alk1 is completely negative so one of the challenges you can expect to see is depending on the type of the clone you use you can see variable staining so something to keep in mind but fda says that you have to use d5f3 clone as a marker for alk rearrangement in lung adenocarcinoma so in this case what do you do we have focal staining so and it was a decalcified paraffin block so we did the fish and fish came back as positive for alk rearrangement and uh, means luckily we had shifted to this decalcification by edta compared to the stronger acids in all those areas where we need molecular testing so then the question is what is the discordance rates between the this alk clone d5f3 and fish according to this article it's about 0.3% but the the overarching uh, the uh, the the message here is doesn't matter how it's positive whether it is by immunohistochemistry or by fish technology they still these patients still respond really well 
by alk targeted therapy by crizotinib so but although in many of the studies they say that the better response is seen in those cases which are fish negative ihc positive like an 100% response rate compared to something like ihc negative fish positive like 63% response rate but it's important to keep in mind about the discordance expected especially in the scenario where it is decalcification decalcified material the other important uh, challenge we faced in this uh, particular uh, case was the formalin fixation again uh, this was an older case so we don't have a method or we we have no way to uh, we have no way to tell how much what was the duration of the formalin fixa fixation in this case uh, because ideally you need at least six hours of formalin fixation especially in these kind of scenarios for them for the immunohistochemistry and the molecular testing to be adequate so those are the challenges you can expect and i try to show you that and again the solution here is uh, if you still have this discordance and if you're not able to go into one or the other way and if your oncologist wants you to do an orthogonal testing you can do a NGS panel RNA fusion testing and come up with the answer for this in this kind of scenarios. But otherwise, EDTA would be the best decalcification agent uh, for tissues which are exposed to molecular testing and ideally for immunistic chemistry too. So here's on one more scenario, lung adenocarcinoma cases with bone metastasis. Um, decalcification by EDTA, can we still identify a mutation? Uh, can we still run a whole panel of oncogenic drivers? Yes. So a mutation can be identified at least in 91% of the cases with EDTA or formic acid-based decalcification agents, unlike the stronger acids where is the nucleic acid quantity and quality would be poor. So this is another case where there was a metastatic lung adenocarcinoma to the thoracic spine. On the right side, you can see the HD morphology. It has got a poorly differentiated growth pattern of these tumor cells, but still you can make out that some of them, I don't have a high power, but I, I take my word that some of them had a prominent nucleoli and they do have this glandular, like a vague glandular nested kind of pattern. And they were strongly TTF1 positive and they were also PDL1 positive more than 50 percent but the staining was weaker but they were all membrane staining like what you can see here so in this specific case um, we use a decalcified bone metastatic block um, and then the ngs the next generation sequencing molecular testing was successful and we found two kind of two mutations kras g12c and tp53 mutations uh, so the, the point I'm trying to make here is um, a oncogenic driver mutation can still be detected in a decalcified bone metastasis if you, you choose the right type of decalcification uh, solution. So moving on to the operational or logistical challenges. Again, like I mentioned to you before, the education itself is important. Uh, keeping abreast with the guidelines. The last guidelines were 2018 and we are already like looking at them as uh, outdated because there were a couple of couple more uh, FDA approvals for NTRK uh, rearrangements. Um, so and uh, so they, there's always newer ap approvals coming along and the guidelines need to be uh, uh, need to be revisited. And again, in patients where the invasive testing is not possible, the liquid biopsy is always going to be relevant. And the longer turnaround time, uh, ag again, it depends on if your lab is doing a centralized reflex testing. That means if the molecular, if the molecular testing is initiated by the pathologist at the time of the initial diagnosis of adenocarcinoma. So in our institution, once I see, once we diagnose lung adenocarcinoma, the next thing we do is we reflexly, we get the block and send it for molecular testing and pdl one So there is no time wasted between the diagnosis and 
the results by the molecular testing and 10 days time that is two weeks uh, we have the molecular results for the oncologist to look if the patient needs more than just surgery or many of these patients would have had molecular testing done on fine needle aspirations smears and needle core biopsies so the communication is also very important because uh, prioritize what the patient needs because if the patient already knows if the patient already has a egf or known egf or mutation then you're thinking of resistance to those EGFR mutations. So your priority would be to check for T790M mutation. So the communication with the oncologist would save you a lot of material and energy and also a lot of dollars. And we use uh, what is called as multidisciplinary tumor board with molecular pathology folks. Uh, we get them on board on Zoom. We show the smears to them. We show the cases where we are on the border, sitting at the border, like uh, 50 nanograms, like something around like fewer 50% of cells or 30% of tumor nuclei. Then we show them, uh, try to prioritize if we have to do only DNA extraction or also do RNA extraction because our oncogenomics of the molecular testing NGS panel we can do both DNA and RNA-based uh, uh, mutations and fusions, that's why. So we try to um, check with the molecular pathology people to see which samples we can only do DNA or RNA extraction. And the cases which come from outside, um, especially the consult cases where the patients come to us for uh, the treatment and uh, management pur purposes, we, the nurse navigator is a very important uh, link in the chain where the effective communication with them to see what testing they've already had uh, available in the outside institution compared to what else we need to be doing. So if, you, if they've not done an ALK, we can just run an ALK IHC quick, like within one day we can know the results. Something like morphologically, if the, if the adenocarcinoma has got signet ring cells, we can look for this ALK kind of IHC. So the communication is really important and uh, the most important is safety issue for molecular testing and prioritize your testing based on the needs of that patient and uh, not to waste the tissue on immunohistochemistry if you already if the clinician already knows the diagnosis um, and uh, but sometimes the diagnosis from outside may not be right in that case you have to run your own panel so again it's a balance when to run more than two immunohistochemical stains and when to save the tissue for molecular. But sometimes you have to run the stains to get to the accurate diagnosis. And then in, the, in that scenario, the communication with the clinician is important to tell them that you need one more biopsy, a second biopsy, or even a FNA so that they can start talking that with the patient. Cancer specific biology, in that I'm going to discuss two important things, emergence, emerging new biomarkers and complex genetic abnormalities. The PDL1 testing, even though it's not considered molecular, but they go hand in hand. Um, again, the FDF's approved companion diagnostic test with DECO PDL1 IHC 22C3 clone, that is form DX assay, and more than 1% and 50% tumor proportion scores, that is in lung cancer, we still look at the, the PDL1 stain in the tumor cells, and we still don't consider the immune cells compared to the combined positive score in other cancers. And more than 1% and more than 50%, they are eligible for Keytruda. And recently there was one more drug approved, Semiplimab, approved for more than PDL1 50%. The challenge with this, um, PDL1 testing in various labs is there's so many different platforms. The, so the companion diagnostic test is very specific. They come with preloaded reagents and everything, and it has to be done on a DECO automated platform. But in your lab, if you are constrained by a different platform, then the option is laboratory developed test. So because any change to the manufacturer's specification you get into this laboratory developed test, uh, then the FDA approved kit is not applicable in this, in your scenario. 
Excuse me, Dr. Kulapa, we're at the top of the hour, so we do need to wrap in, in a minute. Sure. So I'll just make a couple of points and then wrap it up and then we're, we'll be good to go. So this study said that 22C3 clone is the best one for interchangeability of pdl one assay uh, based on this meta-analysis. Uh, so it could be the one which you can, if you're trying to validate a uh, 22C3 clone on the platform, what you have in your lab, that's the one to go for. And again, there are so many predicting uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors to for predicting response. I will not go into detail of that. Tumor mutational burden um, is something which is uh, coming up, but it's not universally available and it requires more tissue. And there's more coming up with multiplex immunohistochemistry and immunofluorescence. And finally, complex genetic abnormalities in a tumor, in this tumor, a lung adenocarcinoma to the brain had nine different mutations. So what's the clinical relevance? So obviously you can see on the top KRAS G12C mutation. And generally our sample uh, report shows the different mutations and then the therapies associated and the FDA approved therapies. So that can give an idea for the, means if the academic oncologist already would know about the clinical trials and everything, but if it is a non-traditional one still they get a, some fair idea about what to do with this kind of uh, uh, unusual variants. So to summarize, so tissue still remains an issue. Uh, prioritize the limited tissue by saving it for genetic testing. Uh, try to reduce your number of immunohistochemical stains. And if the PDL1 results come back first, because that's an immunohistochemistry, still it's important to rule out driver mutations in a lung adenocarcinoma before the PDL1 therapy is given to the patient. So with that, I would stop here and uh, thank you very much for ACP and uh, everyone for giving me this opportunity and I will be happy to answer any questions.